My name is John Kelly. My website is yourinnervoice.com, and I was presenting unpublished footage of UFOs near Mount Adams, Washington, in support of all of the long-standing claims of such phenomena in the environment, and I represent a grassroots public level of response to these questions rather than some kind of government institution or other body. But because the Gilliland Estate is such a long-standing, well-known UFO hotspot, it presents an opportunity to bring in higher-end camera equipment to do different kinds of testing and sampling. And through the course of all the sampling, there's a lot of positive results, a lot of signals and different kinds of transmissions in the sky and in the bush, the trees surrounding the property and in the field, with lots of witnesses standing by and usually multi-instrument shots as well. So uh, I've been engaged in this instrumental data collection here for several years, and I'd say that it's been very productive. There's a lot of great results that came from it. Yeah, so maybe you could talk a bit about like how many hours of footage or how long were you shooting, how many years worth, and you know maybe some of the gear that you used to capture all these images. Well, I've been a visitor to the ranch since the late 1990s, but I didn't start recording up here until 2009. And in the course of identifying the best way to proceed, I identified the Panasonic AGDVC-30, which is the ghost hunter's camera, as an optimal night shot instrument that shoots in black and white and several other different modes, but it does it in three CCD, which means it uses a sensor array and provides redundant sensors, uh, which to counter claims that instrumental error may be causing these visual artifacts to appear as UFOs. With a triple sensor array, the possibility of all sensors failing at the same time in the same way is constrained to make that less likely. So there's some due diligence and there's some levels of redundancy in the approach here. It's all being done on a consumer and a grassroots basis, but I think some of the options that are available in technology, usable technologies, can be brought here. And the DVC-30 was one of those. There's a lot of success with color and night shot shooting with that camera. The next instrument that I brought up here was made by a company called Pulsar, and it's called a Recon X550. It's a digital night vision monocular. It uses a Sony imaging sensor that's been optimized with some extra software. And it's one ten thousandth of a lux light sensitivity, 50 millimeter objective, and a 5.5 times optical magnification in a palm-sized unit that's effectively like a celestial observatory in terms of its light acquiring powers. We can see deep into space. And of course, we can see the many objects that are flying and moving around in this environment. When we start to use night vision equipment, it means we expand our visual range into a second spectra, which is the infrared spectra, as opposed to visible light. And so by broadening the range of vision, we are more likely to acquire sightings of different things moving in those environment at those wavelengths, more so than just studying invisible light alone. So the reason for night vision is to expand our range of vision. And that has some sort of connotations because we're now seeing what would formerly be hidden. And the concept of what is hidden is found in the term occult, which has long-standing meaning in Western traditions. So the perceptions of the hidden would imply occult knowledge. So in a way, the night vision equipment is sort of a metaphor for an initiatory or occult practice that allows us to see the invisible. And in the philosophical or metaphysical realm, that would be considered as a form of clairvoyance. So it seems strange, though, that the UFO witnesses that I've interviewed, and so many of them worked with, have been very successful videographers because they uh, have precognitive dreams telling them where to set up their equipment the night before, where and when. And so it could be said that the study of UFO phenomena, first-hand field studies, is a means to awakening individual clairvoyance because we find that effectively people demonstrate clairvoyant behavior as part of these studies. We could say the UFO is the winged disc, is an archetype, for principles discussed in studies like yoga, where the Ajina Chakra, the Ajahn Chakra, is depicted in a yantra with two leaf-like forms surrounding a, a circle, surrounding an inverse triangle with a dot in the center. And this is a meditative visualization that represents the sound of the Om Mantra, being the associated sound or seed sound of the Ajina Chakra, the Ajahn Chakra. And so that winged disc is archetypal within us. And I say that, not unlike someone like Carl Jung, who talked about the UFO's archetype, not only do these have material realities, these objects that we see, because instruments can measure their presence, and we could say that in terms of particle physics that the photons emitted by those objects are being detected on the sensor. So there's physicality. But more than the physicality, the impact on the observer, there's psychic impacts. And as I said earlier, it's not unlike someone who did sort of a, an intensive meditation on the third eye or that chakra with all those characteristics, iconic characteristics, again, the mountain, Mount Adams being the mythical mountain with the E.T. base, the sense of the pyramid or triangle with a temple on it or a portal or a gateway that depicted by that dot. The parallelisms are not lost on me. 
and the concept that the UFO witnesses or the long-time observers cultivate clairvoyance is also not lost on me as well. It's a fact, as I know it from the testimony and demonstrated behaviors of the successful videographers that I've worked with. So I may be biased in the sense that I studied yoga for a long time before I really became actively involved in UFO field research, but I was a long-time reader in the topic and knew of the major initiatives that had taken place in the 50s and 60s as a consequence of childhood readings into the topic. But I've leveraged the advent of the digital era, which means that more and more instrumentation of finer qualities has become more, more accessible to members of the public. And so without an institutional budget, I can still do really interesting data collection in a pioneering way, meaning that I can come to eSETI with newer types of equipment that may not have been used before and contribute to the pool of evidence that's been coming from here for a long time. And at the same time, it's facilitated a way for me to have my own active engagement with the phenomena, meaning that I became a participant in the psychic interactions and I had my equipment set up on time in, in the right place through such means. And I was able to be a part of history, like those who came before me, the people that I studied as a child and their, their productivity, if it was films or photos or whatever it was, I became a contributor to that in a material or concrete way. I mean, my, my videos are an educational legacy that will have lasting meaning to people in future generations until our whole society overcomes its collective you know, need to remain in denial of, or to bastardize certain issues on emerging frontiers of knowledge or science. There will be a need for quality resources that allow people to evaluate evidence on its own terms without dictating the terms of how it may be interpreted. Instrumental evidence supersedes opinion or hypothesis. I mean, in science, the hypothesis has to match the data ultimately. So this data has meaning and it will propel future thought, future education, and it will help young people to evaluate their own potential for you know, interactions with cosmic phenomena that's within our human grasp. You know, we lay stake into that territory of our lives that the universe will support us in that in very concrete ways. Wow, yeah, I, I just uh, comment on that. That's a very deep intention. It's, you know, it's, you're not just out in the field trying to get some UFO footage. It has a, sort of a, a deep intentional, like transformational potential too that you're kind of embedding in, into and in that you're, you're kind of receiving a lot of psychic intuitions as to where to set up and where to be. Is that kind of accurate? Yeah, I mean, I'm following inner developed guidance, which has served me in many ways in other fields of life. I mean, in terms of considering myself as someone who could be successful as a videographer, I was very successful as a photographer, producing a very unique catalog, and that instructed me that I would also be in a position to capture significant video footage over time as well. I think one of the characteristics of my endeavors into these fields or forays is simply that I've accumulated large catalogs in a short period of time, which has sort of allowed me to have several careers, quote unquote, in one lifetime to be a participant in these different types of data collection. And I think that for me personally, it's testimony to the intensive practices that I followed for a long period of time in yoga meditation because it prepared my mind and it advanced me as a person to be a person who could shoulder some of the load, so to speak, of pioneering in these new frontier areas and to be able to bring something back that would encourage further growth and development being the portfolio or catalog of materials. So, yeah, I, I see this for me as part of helping you know the growth and development of society I'm, I'm cultivating an area of knowledge that may not have instant political appeal to a lot of mainstream academics or professional people but i have invested in the future of this type of knowledge because i appreciate that there will be a time not only perhaps just for spiritual reasons i may have already discussed but for a variety of other reasons there will be a significant value in exposing young learners to these types of possible scenarios when we learn that the world exists and acts in ways beyond our sense of limitation of what's possible including our own self-imposed limitations those kinds of things it's very cathartic for us and refreshing to see the world through new eyes or to be reborn so to speak which of course is the meaning of the term initiation we are reinitiated into life through you know profound experiences or learning from the profound experiences of others and when you're looking at the footage, there seems to be a certain amount of discernment that is required in terms of like, is this something that's a natural flying object, is a satellite, is an airplane, versus no, this is something that's not known and it has special characteristics that go above and beyond what you expect to see from a terrestrial object. So maybe you could talk about that discernment process and how you are determining that these are actual phenomena. Well, I think that the most evident is the collection of videos that demonstrates light interactions between flashlights from the ground and the lights in the sky. And this bi-directional communications is 
kind of self-evident in those videos. And there's a large library of this kind of content. This is not something that's just started yesterday. So if we focus on that alone, we understand that the likelihood of FAA-regulated commercial air traffic or military air traffic to engage in such behaviors is extremely limited. We see that you know satellites, which are you know passive instruments for the most part, won't engage in bidirectional communications on demand in real time. That's just not that would be un very unusual. Photographers and videographers, it's important to set baselines, which means producing visual studies of aircraft and helicopters and other known satellites. You know, learning what the ISS is, learning some basics of astronomical navigation to know which stars are which place, which planets are in which place, you know, what might be appearing that night that's already expected, what meteor showers happen at this time of year. Just, you know, having a basic knowledge of the landscape, so to speak, in which these events may occur is helpful as a frame of reference. But ultimately, the anomalous phenomena out themselves in unambiguous ways, and particularly through their light displays, that is probably the most common means for that to happen. But, you know, from a very subjective point of view, the videographer could say, well, you know, I just set up the camera and this thing flew in to the shot and it produced the shot all by itself as if it knew that even with my narrow field of view, it could time its passage and its behavior while it moved through the frame in a way that would like startle the observer and it would present itself as anomalous. So again, I'm, I'm characterizing the anomalous behaviors or, or characteristics as light emissions. In infrared night vision, it's monochromatic viewing. So we will see that the pulsations are highly irregular and interactive with flashlights shown from the ground. In color video, we'll see color changing behaviors, which are not common in satellites. The ISS retains its white nucleus and blue corona throughout flight, and that doesn't change from night to night. So objects that are changing colors a lot, cycling through the rainbow, so to speak, are not like that. And that's one distinguishing characteristic. Finally, you know, there are reference materials like charts and tables that are calculated and published daily to tell us what objects in the sky. And I know someone says there's no satellites, but at the same time, I'm not so willing to surrender to this hypothesis that everything's just a top secret military program either. Because if the answer to everything in life was that everything's a big military secret, we must have well closed the colleges and universities because there's no point in trying to acquire any new knowledge. The premise of my work is based on understanding that ultimately these phenomena are knowable and accessible if we will attempt to reach out that there will be meaningful interactions that will be instructive to us. And uh, it's been my experience, and I've documented that this is happening. So I am a great believer in human potential, and I think that in a limited sense, anything that I can model for people to inspire them to make their own discoveries is part of the work that I'm doing. Cool. And you know, it seemed like you also had some shots of anomalous phenomena flying, what I would perceive as being behind trees. Maybe you could comment on stuff that you are filming that appears to be closer down to the the surface of the Earth rather than out in space. So, so an exceptionally bright object that is close to the horizon is mysterious because being close to the horizon, if it's traveling at a high altitude, it means it's really a long ways away at that point by the time we see it. And so its ability to exhibit greater luminous output at such range is really mystifying. It's more likely that a super bright object at the horizon is nearby. Proportionally speaking, it could be within a mile here, it could be within a half a mile or less because of the way the documentation has shown us. The Yakima lights are the well-known phenomena in the Yakima region, which we are in. We're just on the west side of Mount Adams. Yakima Nation Reservation is on the east side, and we see Yakima lights from here. It's a known phenomenon. It's like Heseldon lights in Norway. It's been studied under a local engineer, undertook a study here for several years, several decades, excuse me, and he was connected with Dr. J. Allen Hynek, who was the Project Blue Book federal government UFO scientist. So there's some discussion about... Close Encounters of the Third Kind, the film featuring Yakima light, mystery lights type effects. It was an influence in that film, in other words. And this location continues to attract news crews and documentary crews to discuss the ongoing issues, the witnesses, and the videos that continue to come from this location. I'm just building upon a body of work or body of investigation that's been going on for a long time here. Hmm. And so you're also talking about the symbolic nature of interpreting some of these shapes and forms and speaking at archetypal language and communication, maybe you could talk a bit about this type of insight and communication uh, that you're deriving from more of a symbolic perspective. Well, it may sound incredibly subjective, but of course, as the videographer or photographer, I am entitled to have an opinion about the footage. The fact is that my photographic catalog depicts the same icons that I've also resolved in video, except in much higher resolution. I have a roadmap of high resolution photography that is more than just a little mystical, and it's iconographic in nature. These are full-frame images rather than a lot of highlights with only a few pixels, like full 5-megapixel frames, entire frames, with the full-frame images in them. 
so I have a, I have significant data that serves as a guideline, and I'm I'm communicating with the universe, so to speak, or the consciousness of the universe through these interactions. If we go back to you know why why would I put any weight on symbolic interpretations of video frames? Again, I'm saying that I have references in much higher resolution photography that show me that there's merit in such a study. But two, it's simply that it comes back to this idea of the simplicity of human cosmic interactions. The concept in Zen yoga or Zen meditation, Zen Buddhism of the Satori is about a spontaneous enlightenment, a moment of supreme understanding that manifests not after reading a whole bunch of books, but in an, a moment of awakening, spontaneous moment. And this is one of the premises of many of my works in my life experience has included those type of phenomena. And so I see them as accessible, not something that's just an abstract written in a book, but within the scope of human experience. And so from that point of view, the whole world sort of becomes a guide to self-realization if we learn to read the signposts that are along the way. And the UFO is the symbol of the Ajina Chakra, the winged disc, so to speak, is reminding us of this place of awakening and place of cosmic contact within the human body. And to me, as a spiritual scientist, it's empirical. To others, it still sounds so abstract, but I'm saying that even with the videos or the photos, they can be interpreted in such a way without too much strain of interpretation. There's just, I have substantial data that backs it up. I mean, if I just told people, well, I just had a lot of meditation experiences and, you know, just like everyone else who meditated and, you know, had something happen, I could have all these testimonies. But actually, I have this really intensive, data rich, instrumental catalog of interactions. And I can fairly say that, you know, the photographic phenomena are not possible for human creators and studios at a professional international level of photographers, you show them these images. Can you recreate one of these? And they say, no, I can't because of the factors involved, you know, uh, in coordinating all these elements to come into such large scale forms and such high resolution. It's really not within the threshold of sort of median human performance. So this is a threshold of high performance. And what it means is that there's a consciousness engaged there that has constrained the elements in very intense, rich, high contrast ways and guide the organization of elements like water molecules suspended in the air. So, you know, from the most neutral standpoint, I mean, that would imply the existence of a cosmic consciousness. And the legacy of yoga and yoga samadhi and Chan Buddhism and Zen Buddhism with the nirvana, these practices and principles are as accessible today as they were in the ancient past. And the people of today can relive the great experiences of our spiritual predecessors you know, it's all within the realm of human experience. We simply have to want that more than other things we may be attached to. I mean, you know, if you want to be an Olympic athlete, you may have to change your diet. If you want to be an astronaut, you may have to go have a special training program. You know, so all these things in life, if you want to be a super mind development person, you know, have cosmic consciousness, you may have to orient your life around that to ensure you succeed. But I say, and I bring evidence, that it's within our grasp and that we have, you know, we're, we're supposed to be, you know, as I said in my talk, we're supposed to be enlightened. We're supposed to become wise. Life is supposed to be a journey to wisdom. It's our destiny to know, not to remain in ignorance. And this is self-knowledge, this concept of self-knowledge as the real knowledge is an ancient idea. And, you know, it's an opportunity for us to turn our clairvoyance upon ourselves, so to speak, and to learn who we really are. How has the process of gathering all this footage and having these interactions, how has that changed you and on your spiritual path? Well, uh, it changes, I guess, there's neurological changes because to be able to handle the camera equipment under those kind of stresses, it takes development. And so early on, as a videographer, you lose more shots due to nerves and not being able to hold the camera on the subject. And eventually the nerve system becomes stronger and able to handle that and you can operate more fluidly under those conditions. I think, though, that really this venue is for me as a medium to reach the public that may not otherwise be accessible. I'm, I'm in a privileged position because of the the data-rich catalog, you know, it's a carte blanche for me to international audiences. And there's a reason why, ultimately, from a spiritual practitioner's point of view, is simply that those wavelengths that I've been studying will, through indirect contact, will influence the collective thought on a mass scale. So someone who did a lot of meditation for a lot of years and at the same time was given access to audiences in, in the millions at a time, then I would understand the significance of that was simply about a transfer of consciousness through sound energy, transmission of consciousness, transmission of energy. And these are the kinds of things that listeners to the radio shows would call and talk to about all the high energy stuff happening while the shows were going on because they were 
They were portals, you know, the voice, as you and I talked about so many years ago before, the voice is this window for expression of higher consciousness. And looking at this phenomena, a common question is uh, that comes up is, you know, who are we and why are we here? And also there's an element of like, who are they and what are they doing in, our, in their interactions with us? And, and I guess in looking at this field, what are some of your thoughts on those? Well, I mean, ultimately, I, I, fundamentally, I, we are all cosmic and we're all of cosmic consciousness and we're all in these different roles, you know, like spaceships and farmers and, you know, all these different positions in life to fulfill a grand design or a grand dream, you know, a wish, a cosmic wish, so to speak. We have these limited forms that have to sleep and eat and so on, but we get to play parts in these incredible, you know, historic moments or history changing or world changing moments. As people, we have, we can be great as people as well. So, you know, who are we? Uh, again, we're cosmic and we are, we have a connection. You know, we're, we're reinforcing our connection with the cosmos. You know, we're being universal people. We're adopting a universal outlook and we're trying to live our lives in a way that's in harmony and that helps to bring harmony to others because we feel that the universe has an order and it's a harmonious order. And this accounts for why all these advanced technologies perform so flawlessly in front of us is because there's integrity you know, between the sense of order and, and advanced civilization. So we're moving collectively that way. And I'm having the experiences in the field and I'm effect, as affected by everybody else by them. But I'm, at the same time, I'm, I'm engaging with them fearlessly because my vision is of a great sense of integration and wholesomeness and togetherness coming as a consequence of all of this. No doubt in my mind, maybe heroic overconfidence, but I think that my approach has been validated through experience and documentation. And so I continue this way. Ultimately, we all have to resolve the questions that are within our hearts, the unresolved issues within us that have brought us here. We have to take care of business in this life. But the life isn't just meant to be a form of drudgery. You know, this idea of the world as a paradise is also something we can realize. And when we're living in what feels like a magical universe for a moment, you know, all our sense of limitation has been suspended. You know, the great potential of unbelievable potential of the universe manifesting right before our eyes, then we start to understand maybe this is why the world was created. Maybe this is why people go through their ups and downs. We struggle and we succeed. We feel a sense of great wholeness and collectiveness through the sharing. You know, we turn to a social identity that's based on unity rather than divisiveness. And we've reharmonized within ourselves. You know, we've healed the wounds between our minds and our hearts. So I think about all of these things. I think about catharsis and self-realization and samadhi and cosmic contacts. And I see it all working together. And my hope is simply that more and more people can be enabled and empowered to encounter those experiences and to bring the benefits, uh, the gifts that come from that to our world on a mass scale for rapid and progressive change. And in, and in the nature of the phenomena, in terms of what is going on, in terms of, do uh, you have any, any insights in terms of like the entities or phenomena that you're seeing as type of the deeper meaning or what the intention is for their interactions with you? Honestly, I mean, I'm not very attached to it, so I'm not trying to like badge anyone with their ID tags or get vehicle registration numbers or you know what logo they're flying under or what flag. I'm really not measuring any of that. So my data is not very useful to someone who's seeking answers to those questions. But suffice it to say that interactions could be summoned. You know, there'd be multi-billion-dollar budget special effects to summon it otherwise with big crews, and they can be summoned by a layperson. It means that there's irrespective of who may be driving the ship, they're fulfilling something, a bigger purpose. There's a greater authority that's driving events and that we humans are not the only participants in. We have a destiny to integrate with you know other parts of the universe and other civilizations. And I, as you may or may not be able to tell, I remain entirely open to the idea that there's all these other life forms and intelligences and politics and economies happening in the universe and we're just a part of a bigger thing. You know, there's definitely going to be a bunch of integrative pan-civilization, cross-cultural fertilization. But how that will all look, I don't know if I will know the answer to that question ever in my life, or if I will really care. Because as I say, if ultimate life's experience is interdimensional, and the samadhis don't require any kind of special equipment other than the human body, if we understand that the chakras and all the nadis, that means that we're basically the, the body is like a spaceship, and the earth is like the launching pad, and the mind is the cosmonaut, then, you know, what do we need other than to just do our own spiritual work, clean up our act, get our lives together, and bring order to our life that's in harmony with the universe, and let that greater wave, you know, propel us forward. You know, I'd be thrilled to meet more advanced beings with better ethics, uh, so that their influence could, you know, help me to become a better person. But 
because ultimately in my life I was given so much experience in the inner dimensions that I have no real attachment to it. I think it's I think the material that I accumulate is, is for educational purposes for the society more so than it's really for me. So my pursuit of that question, again, I'm I'm ambiguous about you know so what. Other people have a deeper connection with that question, and I think it's very interesting to learn from them. But it's enough for me to have like the interdimensional contact and the camera work going at the same time. I think at this era in history, you know, it's a lot, and the political load of carrying that through a lifetime is also has to be considered because if we look at the predecessors who were influential in different ways, George Adamski's and all the different people who've come before. Their lives weren't over after they stopped shooting the film. <laughs> Things just started, right? Uh, There's a lot of implications. So, you know, this UFO business is one of my areas of interest. It's one of the fields that I'm engaged in. It's not the only field I'm engaged in. But I'm a participant, and I'm positioned by circumstances to be a participant in this for a long time to come. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for talking to me again. It's great to be with you. Mm-hmm.